Who reviews the reviewers? We do. This is Yesterzine, where we rejudge a magazine's best and worst rated games, and dive deeper to find out what games coverage was like when it was entirely acceptable for a magazine's single email address to be pcreview at cix.compulink.co.uk. For that matter, when Compulink itself didn't seem like a name so quaint and old fashioned you'd expect to see it on Henry VIII's business card. As you may have deduced from the email address, it is once again the holy month of December, and our magazine is EMAP's classic hobbyist magazine, PC Review. In May 1992, the PC was still crawling out of its business hole, and there were no dedicated games tomes for the system. So the PC owning games fan turned to this, and PC Format, who at least reviewed games, even if they were doing hardware too. That said, this era's PC Review was a games magazine in all but name. There's a buyer's guide we'll get a peek at later, and a low effort four pages on upgrading a processor, still useful information for the gamer. But there's barely a spreadsheet or disk defragger to be found, which is good, because we've got a bountiful crop of reviews. The Gaming Heaven is a famous technical marvel, but did it come too early for the still developing PC game scene? And there's a Gaming Hell film licence where PC Review can't decide on a publisher, and are technically wrong both times. First though, a lesson in PC graphics. No, no, don't go away, stay. There's a laser gun in a minute, come back! Dangerous things PC games around this era. Around the start of the 16-bit era a few years earlier, Amiga games looked like this, and PC ones looked like this. The first colour graphics cards for PC did four colours, and someone in their infinite wisdom decided what needed to join white and black was cyan and magenta. Or, for the men in the room, blue and pink. There were other possible palettes, but Commodore 64 owners objected saying green and brown was their thing. If you're a C64 owner, ignore the above and listen to this. There were other possible palettes, but Nintendo 64 owners objected, saying green and brown was their thing. The Amiga meanwhile was sitting there, lording it over everyone with 32 colours on screen, which it could choose from 4,000 of the buggers. Games looked better on a £300 MIGI than on a PC when a good PC cost more than five times that even if by now the PC was starting to have the advantage on sheer processor grunt. It's about here though that VGA cards are getting common on PC. You can have 16 colours at four times the Amiga's resolution, or a full 256 colours at the same res, and these can be chosen from over 200,000 colours. If you, for instance, needed 256 different near identical browns, you could do it. You know, if you were nostalgic for a certain look. And then Super VGA, which innovated the concept of a standard by not being one, and requiring anyone writing software to provide a separate driver for every single chipset that used it. This, I'm afraid, is the root cause of why you in 2022 have that awful NVIDIA experience app on your PC. It's also the reason The Lion King didn't run on some compact PCs. Something which would have been less of a problem if Compaq hadn't done a deal to bundle Lion King with all of their PCs. Sound too. Early PCs had a beeper. It sounds like this. In 1987, the same year as the launch of the Amiga 500, Adlib made the first sound card anyone cared about, and their reward was to go out of business almost exactly the time this magazine was published. This was mostly due to the existence of the Sound Blaster, which arrived in 1990, and like VGA was becoming properly popular by about this time. Which means, 1992 is the crossover. A smart PC version will leave the Amiga version, and indeed Mega Drive and SNES, in the dust. A bad one is going to look very, very old. The gaming heaven is especially dangerous. Another world, or out of this world if you live in other leading countries, comes from Delphine, to this point known for quality adventure games Future Wars and Operation Stealth, and soon to be known for the never really properly imitated Cruise for a Corpse. Eric Chahi worked on Future Wars, but turned down Operation Stealth in order to bring his idea for this to market. It's pretty for the time. Very pretty. 
This is the floppy disk version and the full intro is still present. Ian Scientist drives his Ferrari up to the secret underground lab and you immediately wonder why this is supposed to be the good guy. Nonetheless, he launches his secret experiment, like all good guys do, named after just a number. Like all good guys do. And also, like all perfectly legitimate scientists, this Ferrari owning, secret underground laboratory owning, perfectly normal everyday guy also has his own particle accelerator. Exactly the kind of thing a private individual with absolutely no secrets to hide doing entirely legal above board work hides in an underground laboratory. Let's just say I don't think this guy is declaring the full taxable value of his business assets. Nonetheless, just after horribly dating this game by having a drinks can with a detachable ring pull, it all goes horribly wrong. Which at least gives us an opportunity to explore the first notable thing about the actual gameplay of this. It begins immediately, and if you don't notice, could potentially be one of the quickest possible game overs you can get. If you spawn into the pool and don't move, then you are dead in approximately 1 30th of the time it took to watch the intro, about 5 seconds. But at least we do have what seems to be infinite lives to play with. We climb up, out of the pool and play with our controls, which consist of the usual move keys plus a sprint button. Up, even on a keyboard, is to jump. Wonderful. Death lies around every corner. These bugs are lethal and our restart point is back in the pool. I'll save some time here. Here is what's supposed to happen. You climb out of the pool, run right to avoid the bugs, encounter the bear thing, at which point you immediately run left, avoid the bugs and get to the cliff where you jump and grab the rope, which breaks, and then you run right, avoiding the exact same bugs again, until you reach the original screen where mysterious strangers shoot the bear thing for you. You need to know all this before you start really, because run from the bear insufficiently immediately and he kills you. Don't leap for the rope immediately and he kills you. Don't know exactly how to time the bug jumps and... There's a reason this first level is all a lot of people have seen. There are times, and this first section is the poster child, where another world is the unholy spawn of criminally unfair platformer Rick Dangerous and full motion video pioneer Dragon Slayer. It's pretty, very pretty. Even now you could have launched this exact version cold and the indie scene would have swooned. But it's often as much a memory test as a game. All too often the only way to win is to do exactly what the game wants you to do with the timing it wants you to do it in. This is also not the last time you'll encounter hazards that you can only possibly avoid if you know about them in advance. Still, we're done now, and these friendly chaps will surely take us to some sort of reasonable tutorial level where things will be explained to us. Oh, well that's lovely. More cutscene ensues, which at least represents the point at which you'll get your first restart point if you die again. Less fortunately, that restart occurs in prison. The world's simplest puzzle is hinted at, the way to escape is indeed the classic shake the cage until it breaks gambit, where in a stroke of luck it crushes your friendly local jailer. Even better, he drops his gun, giving you and your fellow prisoner a chance to do a runner. Again though, you're not doing that first time with any level of skill, because a guard steps in from where you've literally just been and shoots you near instantly if you're not ready for him. The process continues. The only way I can find to defeat the remaining guard is to shield from him until Buddy's finished disabling the lock, which again is something you have to discover. And then there's a maze of a lift that half the time your escort candidate refuses to get on or runs off ahead of you. Which is a problem, because the guard in this room, which you do have to go to, immediately shoots if you're not pummeling the fire button as you enter the room, so Buddy is doomed if you don't go first. Even if you know what you're doing, then especially in the first section of this level, Buddy sometimes gets shot for no apparent reason and thus you're trapped. I resorted to a walkthrough to do the last bit because you have to realise that this light, identical to 90 million other lights, is the one that disables the power to the building. This allows you to blast through the barrier and escape. Except it doesn't, because every time I successfully got to that point, my gun had stopped working. Presumably through running out of power from an unseen power gauge. It's hard to shake the Dragon's Lair comparison. Really, the solution so far is doing exactly what the game wants you to do with precise and invisible timing. I imagine there's ways to do what I'm doing that involve using less gun power, thus leaving me some, 
but after an hour of beating my head against five screens, even with a walkthrough, I'm not inclined to find out. There is something else to try. In 2013, along came the 20th anniversary edition, a mere 22 years after the original Amiga version of the game. Maybe that's made some changes to fix some of the unfriendliness, just as Dragon's Lair 2 did on home conversion. And to be fair, they have. For a start, that enemy is missing. And I shoot through this whole sequence first time by at least attempting to be a little careful with the gun. I don't know if they've been kinder, or if I got lucky to achieve that though. They've also been a lot kinder with the restart points, and it makes a huge difference to not have to shake your cage loose or swim out of the pool every time you lose a life. It's also beautiful. This in itself is nearly a decade old now, but there's very few games in this style to touch it. The Dragon's Lair comparison doesn't get better in the next section, with this sequence of barely lit tunnels with surprise unmarked steam vents, but actually only one possible wrong turn. You could play it blindfold with a little practice. I was baffled, so I asked on Twitter and got a range of responses, but it did seem a lot of the people still calling it a classic only played it in 1992. There were several not aged well responses too. I suddenly wonder how many of those have most recently played the 20th edition. That also threw up an incredible article on how it works in the back end that Julian Regal kindly linked me to. That reveals that I'm not entirely off base, because Dragon's Lair was an inspiration for the game. So what to do for a verdict? Well, I have to leave it to you. You've now seen about a third of the game. Do you want to try and figure out the rest yourself? There's several long play videos, which tend to be a little over half an hour if you want to go that way. Me? I'm probably going to make my way through in a spare moment, but I'll be using a walkthrough every step of the way, and if I had one piece of advice, play the 20th edition. It's on almost every machine you can buy in 2022. You do have to be in awe a bit of another world. It was immense then, and it's worth pointing out that despite me banging on about the comparisons, it's not as sadistic as Rick Dangerous, and at least gives you infinite lives. And it's not pre-rendered and on a path, like Dragon's Lair. It deserves people's respect and admiration. But as with your mum, I'm not going to tell you if it still deserves people's joysticks. Like a lot of magazines, PC Review bulked out its page length with a buyer's guide. They've gone business with it though. It covers games in multiple genres, but also, more interestingly for us 30 years on, hardware. We're going to be with this thing for the next 22 pages, and I've no more idea of what we're going to find as I type this than you are. Let's go with Classic Game of the Month. Lemmings, apparently. To be entirely fair to them, PC Review has at no point used the word retro, and we're about three years from the concept of retro gaming achieving any kind of mainstream use. But still, at the time they were writing this issue, Lemmings was barely a year old. So that'd be like us today choosing a game's release from November 2021 as our retro game of the month, which would mean, just let me check, Grand Theft Auto 5 or Skyrim. Okay, bad example month. PC Review justify themselves by contending that in future all games like Lemmings will simply be called a Lemmings. They also claim it's okay because there will never be a game like Lemmings. They were half right in these two statements. The PC's dearth of action games back in 1992 is highlighted. Every single title in this section is more famous on the Amiga, including the box out game Interphase, which I had never heard of, but did make it into the mid-range of Amiga Power's first top 100. Interphase is published by Imageworks, as are seven of the ten choices. A little unfortunate, since Imageworks had just gone out of business taking commercial distribution of most of these titles with it. Further evidence of slim pickings is they're forced to include both Speedball and Speedball 2, the recently mentioned Rick Dangerous in sequel form, and Xenon 2, about which more next month. This would remain a weakness of the PC until 3D cards and a pile of PlayStation conversions would start its path to near universal supremacy around 1995. Until then, if you don't know what to do, maybe glance your eyes right and talk to the world's least ambitious hairdresser. The next section though is where the PC was king. Flight simulators. There is a huge chunk of my childhood here, most notably from Microprose and Spectrum Holobyte, two companies who would be merged inside two years of this list. I'd pick out F117A Stealth from Microprose and Falcon 3.0 as absolutely iconic sims of this or any other era personally, but we should also draw attention to the optimistically named Gunship 2000 in the helicopter genre. 
Notable 2 is one of Microsoft's earlier flight simulator releases. While simpler than the recent reboot, it has exactly the same DNA. The driving game selection is also thin, the PC in a fallow between the iconic titles of the early days and the rapidly approaching dawn of proper wheel and pedal race sims. There's some stuff though, although the correct choosing of 4D sports driving, aka stunts, is slightly ruined by describing it as a cross between Accolade's test drive and hard driving. Yes, there's a reason for that, and YZ long timers already know it. Stunts authors DSI created test drive. Stunts, though, was a result of them splitting with and being sued by Accolade, and the first instalment of the series without them has also made the list. If we're honest, it shouldn't. It's not as good as either one or two, much less stunts, but more importantly had a bug where the speed of the game was entirely connected to the speed of the PC, which is absurd on modern machines, but even on the 386s of 1992 it would have been awkward at best. Two more DSi games on the list too, Bill Elliott's NASCAR Challenge and Mario Andretti's Racing Challenge. These were guys who liked to stick to naming conventions, certainly. Neither has aged super well on this format, but Mario at least innovated, and both it and the very different Mega Drive port are worth a punt. A tip of the hat to legendary oval racer and grandparent of iRacing, Indianapolis 500 too, a game that was at its best on PC. We walk past the confusing simulation other section in order to wave at old friend Railroad Tycoon. War is a subcategory of strategy in which I know none of the games, so with absolutely no knowledge I'm going to recommend Command HQ simply because Microplay was a microprose brand. I say it's a subcategory, it's technically the only one, although stay tuned for the thrilling conclusion there. Fantasy RPG 2 was a genre big enough on PC to demand its own section, although anything that puts Core Design's corporation and Eye of the Beholder against each other was always going to be a broad church. Brain Teasers is a very old PC way of putting puzzle game. This is predictably where Klax and Tetris live, along with Emotion, a game about matching coloured balls. This only catches my eye because I've just got this on Game Boy, and although I've not played that version, I can see a problem with the preceding sentence already. Speaking of the Game Boy, I draw your attention to Spot, which is the same license as Cool Spot, but from an era where the good people at 7up thought their action image would be best summed up by a game of Othello. Sport is its own section, but on a definition which doesn't include driving, or either of the speedballs apparently. Anyone would think they're just making this stuff up. In any case, it also doesn't include any football games, which probably dates this more than any other. It does include another of our old friends, Powerboat USA, which is, apparently, not a driving game. Adventure, in the sense of point and click, was huge on PC at this point, nearing its peak of popularity. We're in the era of the Monkey Island and Indiana Jones games from LucasArts, but also Leisure Suit Larry, Kings and Space Quest from Sierra, Delphine's Operation Stealth gets a call out too. You were absurdly well served as a fan around this time. Arcade strategy is a thing, no, me either. It includes Elite, Midwinter, Battle Chess, even though Chess Master was a brain teaser, Civilization, even though it's about as arcade as the Trocadero in 2022, and bafflingly, Gods from the Bitmap Brothers, which is basically a straight platformer. Someone threw this whole thing together on a Friday afternoon. Thankfully we're also done. These were the only categories of games allowed on a 1992 PC. No open world, no 3D, no section even for shooting games despite Wolfenstein 3D on the horizon. Possibly because of price, PC gaming was very standoffish from the rest of the world at this time. If nothing else, games like Another World were starting to change that. Hardware though is an eye-opener. This is a 30 year old magazine of course, but if you think hardware has gone up in price recently you're about to get a shock. Bear in mind from this point on that all these prices are effectively two and a half times higher than they seem with UK inflation since 1992. For instance, what if you have Amstrad's 386 PC model and want to upgrade it to 16 megabytes of RAM, a whole 0.05% of what's in the PC I'm using to write this script? Well, that will be £815 to you, sir. Which these days, even before inflation, could easily buy you a very quick new laptop. Why not a hard disk? 
42 megabytes should do it. That'll hold nearly 10% of a CD after all. £200 will get you a Seagate, and you too might just about have room to install Monkey Island 2, so long as you delete Dad's special folder. These days, that will buy you several million megabytes. Graphics cards though are genuinely cheaper. Although even the fancy £100 cards from Dataplex and DS will just about get you 256 colours, showing the, and I quote, potential of PC games. You'll need a sound card too. None of this stuff is on motherboards in 1992. You can get an adlib for under 100 quid, but hurry because they're already on borrowed time. As mentioned, what everyone actually did was spend £150 on a Sound Blaster 2 from the then charmingly named West Point Creative. Have one of those fancy new CD drives though? You'll need the £250 version. In these days, your CD drive connected to the sound card. Those CD drives are starting to appear, hardly surprising since the CD is the size of 10 of your hard disks, but you can't write to them and they'll also cost you £300. Still though, you get a free copy of World Atlas for that. So in 2022 cash, that's £1500 or so for a CD drive and something to connect it to. Want to plug in a joystick? You'll need a card for that too. USB is half a decade away. Sometimes I think people started using Linux in the late 90s just because otherwise PCs were starting to get too easy. Plenty available though. Although the genre bias of the PC means almost all of them are analogue ones, and not great for action titles. Windows 3.1 is barely a thing at this point, and maths probably tells you how long it'll be before Windows 95 brings mainstream gaming to the graphical interface. So too are mice. The £30 minimum you'll be charged for one of Genius's awful creations will happily buy you a very nice new mouse 30 years later. And you don't spend 40% of your life cleaning a new one. Said 2022 mouse will probably be from Logitech, who likely only exist now because of all the people who paid £120 for the cordless mouse man in 1992. I could tell you how much going online wasn't yet a universal thing in 1992, but I'm just going to point out that these modems, which would take about an hour to receive one megabyte, or a little under two months to download a 2022 sized PC game, start at £200 or so. A category for dot matrix printers under £300 is another giveaway on the age, although to be fair, they also didn't require a £300 ink refill if you so much as think about printing a photo on one. Inkjets did exist, PC Review incredibly optimistically describing them as virtually silent. They will start at a grand. They mostly don't do colour. But hey, why do a printout? If you've got a spare four hours, you can simply email the picture instead, assuming you knew the other guy in the UK with a modem. Software is a nasty shock too. In 2022, there is usually functional free software to do what you like. Our first section is graphics software, and two free applications, GIMP and Paint.net, were used in the production of this very video. In 1992, the standard cheap paint program for PC and Amiga is Deluxe Paint. It's £100. Corel's Paint Shop Pro costs less than that now, and its grandparent was £300 in 1992. Even without inflation it's eye-opening. With inflation, it's the best part of a grand. The DTP software for every budget starts at £150 in today's money. If you think your £200 modem was enough to get you online, think again. Windows has nothing much built in to help you. Microsoft didn't see the whole thing coming. So, want a Discord? £70. Want a remote desktop? £100. Want a Procom? It doesn't say. Either what it is or what it costs, I probably shouldn't have ended on that one. Music? Baffling. Also the software. We're so long ago that you're buying antiviral software, which is absolutely what your grandmother calls it. Norton will charge you 150 actual quid for it. Dr. Solomon's is a mere 70 pounds until you want a year's updates, which is another 100 pounds. Other things that are free now that were expensive then? The recently updated auto route, which is like Google Maps, except it takes forever, doesn't automatically get map changes, and taking it with you in the car is incredibly awkward. Still, 
You can simply use the inkjet printer that cost a month's wages to print the directions and then realise you can no longer afford a car. You need an £80 memory manager to actually get any games to work. If you wanted to write an episode of a top magazine based YouTube series, you'd probably need a £145 copy of Microsoft Works. But also, you know, YouTube. Transfer files between two PCs? 125 quid. And it'll cost you £100 to see what's in your PC. A business that was ruined when they started putting these little windows in. I can see it all for free now, Megatech. Where's your god now? Still, if you did need to take auto route into your car, you could simply buy a laptop. After all, a 20 MHz Compact 386 can be had for a mere £4,000. £12,000 in today's money for a screen that updates about twice a car journey, but that doesn't matter because it'll have rinsed the battery before you've even had your customary pre-journey McDonald's breakfast. I can't be the only one who does that, right? Still though, that 386 would probably also heat the house, which we could do with right about now. The Taking of Beverly Hills is a movie. This may seem an obvious statement, but it's not something I was aware of before opening this magazine and discovering, minor spoiler alert, that the tie-in game is our gaming hell. I think even before we look at it we know why though. Because it's spring 1992 and we're a year after the release date of the film. Columbia though pulled the movie and low effort threw it at cinemas in the autumn where it failed to make a single one of its 19 million budget back. It currently holds a middle of the road 5 out of 10 on IMDb, which is 3 better than the game is about to do. What passes for a story is a bunch of ex-cops using a chemical spill to distract the current cops and as cover for a string of burglaries during the 70 minutes it'll take the National Guard to turn up. Boomer Hayes gets missed in the confusion and teams up with former plotter and now good guy Ed in order to fix the situation, shortly after failing to make a poster that doesn't totally give away the film's era. So we've got two possibilities here. Either we finally have a polished, finished, thought through movie game because they weren't rushing it to meet either attempt to release the film, or this is going to have been made on a budget of 12p by people you've never heard of in a desperate attempt to make anything back from this unintentional definition of disaster movie. You may be able to tell from the start where I think this is going. That publisher logo would have been just about appropriate in 1982, not 92. And this is their grand entrance, a not especially well formatted logo. Oh, and there is music in the strict dictionary definition sense. Here's what you get for the story. A truck drives in, a truck falls over like Don King has paid it to take a dive in the fifth round, and that's... it. The game sits here roughly forever. And then there is the demo. Wait, is this the demo? I think it might be expecting me to be playing now. I think the game started while I was sitting here. Oh. Okay. Yes, there is no demo, that is me losing by getting randomly run over despite sitting there very visible on a long straight road. Now though, it wants a key press. Still, let's restart and see if we can figure it out as a- oh no, it just quits. Friends, I don't think we're going to be dealing with a classic here. Okay, we're going back in. With the distinct advantage, we now know how starting a game works. The less good news is that this publisher logo and the exciting intro movie are in fact not skippable. So we go for an amble about the town. I've cheated slightly and I know I have to get to the police station, but this is the fire station and I'm dead. And it's quit. The publisher logo and the exciting intro movie are in fact not skippable. So we take a different route through the city looking for the cop shop. We avoid the tank because it's probably military and find the car dealer, which looks like the fire station, and I'm dead. And it's quit. The publisher logo and the exciting intro movie are in fact not skippable. So we take an even more different year route through the city looking for the Popo Lounge, and discover the truck that caused all this mess. Despite the fact it's supposed to be a toxic spill, there's apparently no problem at all me hanging around near it. Still. Nothing is looking like a pigmatorium anywhere near here, even when I narrowly avoid a shootout at a restaurant, I decide to skip town. 
Let me out! Well, there goes that plan. Anyway, we walk back into town looking for the Lorodrome and instead find what is either the local clothes shop or the lack of clothes shop. And I'm dead. And it's quit. This publisher logo and the exciting intro movie are in fact not skippable. Any normal human would have stopped here. For some reason I didn't and took the option to switch control to Laura, who for some reason is mostly substituted for that cop ed in this game. She though is trapped in a hotel at the start of the game and while there are fewer ex-cops there's even fewer locations and graphics. That said, I've at least found the key the first point at which any of the adventure claim in the marketing has any merit. We find an exit, where helpfully they have left the key over the mat. Which leads us into Alien Breed, without the graphics, or sound, or enemies. Once you escape, it switches back to Boomer, and even though I go to where I know the police station is, it doesn't work. Also, the map now looks like this. Then I get run over on the pavement. I'm done. Still, having watched a couple of videos on YouTube, neither of whom could be bothered to play this for more than six minutes, if it works, then this is the police station, where you need to hunt for a gun, vest and walkie-talkie. Oh, there they are. Not exactly Discworld, is it? There is, though, a reason this video is six minutes long, because they complete it in that time. If you want to save yourself the hell, there's a link below for you to watch the whole game in less time than it takes to listen to a medium-length Marillion song. It also means that there is literally nothing to show you during the summing up, so here's that unskippable intro again. This is beyond appalling. It is the worst thing we've seen on this channel since Ultraman. Technically, it's exactly that game I speculated on at the start, where being slightly out of date makes it, ironically, another world compared to the state of the art on PC. The best thing about it is it's only six minutes long, but Capstone wanted to charge you 30 quid for it. The film is all but forgotten now, but I found a copy on YouTube. It takes 25 of its 80 minute runtime to get to the point where the lorry falls over. It is now largely forgotten, and if we could all agree to do the same with the game, that would be lovely. Thanks. On the back page once again, the same thing as last month. It's like we're Maverick magazines, isn't it? And if that reference escapes you, I highly recommend episode 13. Right now though, we're concerned with Sub5000 TV, the feel-good YouTube playlist of videos from over 30 of your new favourite gaming related YouTube channels, held together with a TV style presentation. It's like Christmas Day TV with none of the tedious Christmas bit. But if this holiday season you'd like to spend over 10 hours avoiding any responsibility but watching lovely people talk about lovely things, get thee to the description right now. And if that doesn't take your fancy, also in the description is a link to the official Dosemba playlist for even more DOS fun. Although more fun than the taking of Beverly Hills is probably fairly easy to remember. And if that doesn't work, I suggest engagement via this teaser trailer. Or go watch more Yesterzine, but not the last really good one because that's the one we selected for the TV channel. And if you can get through all of that in a month, come back here because last Friday in January there will somehow be more of this and I already know it's going to be a doozy. See you in 2023.